Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Public education is in peril. Efforts to reform public education are ironically diminishing its quality and endangering its very survival. We must turn our attention to improving the schools, infusing them with the substance of genuine learning, and reviving the conditions that make learning possible. So concludes Diane Ravitch's new book, The Death and Life of the Great American School System, How Testing and Choice Are Undermining Education. Joining me in the second of a two-part conversation on the death and life of the American school system is Diane Ravitch. She's research professor of education at New York University and is the preeminent historian of urban education in the United States. Professor Ravitch is also a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. From 1991 to 1993, Professor Ravitch was Assistant Secretary of Education and Counselor to the U.S. Secretary of Education. She is the author of 10 books and has edited 14 others, and she has written more than 500 articles and reviews for scholarly and popular publications. And the New York Post calls her an educational poobah. Welcome back, Diane. Wonderful to be here, Diane. Let's just review the first show. We touched on the, the perversities of the current reform movement, specifically how testing and choice are undermining education. Today, we're going to continue talking about the national look, but focusing more on New York City, looking at the Bloomberg and Klein, and if you will, the decline of public education in New York. Let's start with children first. Mayor Bloomberg's stated educational policy after he assumed control of the schools in June of 2002. Well, the, uh, the mayor uh, concluded that the big problem in public education was public involvement. And so uh, what he got the state legislature to do was to give him control and to give him uh, a school board uh, in which he appointed eight out of 13 members, and they served at his pleasure. And uh, when he introduced his eight votes, uh, he said, I don't expect to ever see you quoted in the paper. You serve at my pleasure, and, you know, you'll be fired if you speak out. And some of them did in the social promotion issue, right. and guess what happened? And three of them, th or two, or th two of his appointees threatened to vote against him, and he fired them on that day and replaced them with people who would vote for him. Since then, there has never been a vote where any of his appointees have failed to support whatever he wanted. And consequently, uh, whenever parents are unhappy, they really have no place to turn. They're, the parent involvement is completely outside the school system at this point. Why then did the legislature, which had provided for a, 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 a re-upping of the law after review, essentially do the same thing it did the first time around, given the, even given the problems that had been obviously manifested. Well, the, uh, I think the legislature assumed that uh, uh, Mayor Bloomberg would have two terms, and at the end of his second term, they would come back and review mayoral control, and there'd be a, a new pl person coming in, and then they would review the situation. But Mayor Bloomberg wanted his top priority uh, with his reelection was getting mayoral control again, uh, and he really pulled out all the stops to make sure, in particular, that the uh, members of the of the school board, uh, which he renamed the Panel for Educational Policy, uh, that they served at his pleasure. Uh, there was a strong counter movement to have members with a fixed term so that they might exercise some independence, uh, but he made it his highest priority to make sure that uh, that didn't happen. And you know, he's got a lot of power, a lot of money, and a lot of legislators who want to help him and please him. And this is all part of the ideology that we talked about last week of reform. Reform has come to be defined as choice, whether it's vouchers or, or now more so charter schools, and accountability, which means testing. So New York City in some ways is one of the examples of these 
ideas in practice. So let, let, let's look at it. You wrote a piece called Mayor Bloomberg's Crib Sheet. What's the crib sheet and what is he cribbing? Well, um, of course, that was not my headline. It was the New York Times I'm, headline I'm sorry. writers. Uh, that, but, did it accurately but reflect? It, well, what, what I was arguing in that in that particular piece was uh, that, that the the mayor's claims about the dramatic improvement of the school system were based on what what we now know were wildly inflated uh, state test scores. And I think even the chancellor and the mayor now acknowledge that the state scores are completely unreliable. But for the purpose of the election, uh, they looked pretty good. I mean, dramatic numbers of kids were passing the test, but that was true across the state. The state, New York State says, or at least it did in 2009, that something like 70% of the kids are proficient in uh, reading and 80% or more are proficient in math. On the national test, it's more like 30%. So it's a 50-point gap between what the federal tests say and what the state okay, tests say. Okay, now let, let's look at these tests because you can get lost in the test. It's almost like test, damn test, and mm -hmm. more damn tests. Right. Talk about the national test and talk about the state test, the differences, and why one is considered the gold standard right. and the other is fool's gold, if right. you will. Well, the, the national test is, it's called NAEP, which stands for the National Assessment of Educational Progress. It's a federal agency. Uh, President Clinton appointed me to two terms on the board mm -hmm. uh, of, that oversees the NAEP test. Uh, the test is given every other year in reading and math. Uh, in every state in the country. It's not given to every child, it's given to scientific samples in every state. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are no stakes. Uh, nobody knows whether they passed or failed, whether they got a high or a low mark. No teacher gets a pun punishment. Uh, you can't prepare for it because no one knows who's gonna take it. And so since you can't prepare for it, uh, wow. Go ahead. you can't prepare for it and there are no stakes attached to it, it's generally considered a very accurate measure of do kids actually know how to read? Can they comprehend? Uh, can they do the math? Uh, NAEP, as it happens, also gives tests in history and geography uh, and civics and writing and a, and a bunch of in, in science, uh, but those are not accountability tests. This, the reading and math tests are required by Congress every other year, and it's considered an audit of the state results. So the states trying to meet this No Child Left Behind's 100 percent requirement, the mandate, 100 percent of your children will be proficient by oh. the year 2014. So Which this, we talked about last right? week as being absolutely absurd. Absolutely absurd. No state, no nation has ever reached 100%. The highest performing state in the nation is Massachusetts, and 50% of the kids there are proficient. That's very good. And New York State is more like 35%. So New York State scores have been going, on the state test, the scores have been going up to 70%, 80%, and some districts 90% are, are meeting proficiency because the pass mark keeps going lower and lower. Okay, talk, talk about, we talked about gaming the system. How is the New York State system gained through these, the, the state tests? Well, in, in New York State, uh, the state has been, uh, every year in Albany, they call a press conference and they say the scores are up. They're up 5%, they're up 10%, they're up 12%, and every year the scores go up and up and up. And when, when the state started testing children in compliance with No Child Left Behind, grades three through eight, they started in 2006. Mm -hmm. And from 2006 to 2009, there was a steady drop in what's called the cut score. The cut score is what you have to pass in order to be considered moving from level one to level two, level two to level three. Each, at each point, the cut score was dropping. And so the number of proficient students either proficient, remained the same or went up no, because... proficiency was going up. While but, the but, score... But meanwhile, the kids who were level one, which is the lowest level, right. went down, so the very few kids are now identified as level one, so, but many more are proficient. So the, meanwhile, the federal tests have shown that in New York State, there has been virtually no change in uh, the percent who reach proficiency since 2002. Okay, so one of the elements of proficiency in, in, in the data, mm -hmm. the, the lies, damn lies in statistics data, is that the cut scores are lower. So right. what is proficient it varies from year to year, so right. it's becoming dumbing right. down as the number of right. people are more proficient because they have to meet the mandates of right. No Child Left Behind. So okay. basically, in, in, in New York State, we've had a rubber yardstick, and the the cut scores go down, down, down. The pass rate goes up. But on the federal test, New York State looks like this. It's okay. a, it, we're flatlining, in other words. How else does New York State or, or, or the system well, game the system? Well, the main thing is changing the testing so that so that we can report to the public about how many kids are proficient. Right. In New York City, we just got reading scores that came out from the federal government. Right. 
the, the achievement gap is enormous. Eighth grade reading scores, I mean, we saw some improvement, finally, in fourth grade reading for New York City. And, these, and you see these improvements as real well, in fourth grade in reading. In fourth grade, but it took six years to get there. From, okay. two, from 2003 to 2007, no improvement. Then in 2009, we finally saw some gains in the city and reading. Significant marginal? No, there were significant fourth grade gains. Okay. But in eighth grade, there have been no gains at all. So what, what, how do they lose the gain? I mean, what happens in those four years? All I can tell you, well, they, did, they never gained anything in the fourth grade before. So these kids now, they've been in the, okay. they've been in the city system uh, all along. They've been tested every year, and they're reading no better now than they were 10 years ago. There have been no gains at all. This is for the eighth graders. When you look at the eighth grade scores, you see that about 40% of the white and Asian kids are proficient compared to 12 and 13 percent of black and Hispanic kids. Tremendous achievement gap. And, though, and that gap is not closing? No. That with all the quote-unquote reforms, the charters, et cetera, that, no. is, it, is it mythology that charters are and have been successful in closing these achievement gaps? Well, we have, there have been two studies of New York City charters, and they both come out with, with positive findings. Uh, the first study came from Carolyn Hoxby, mm -hmm. who was with me, a member of the Corette Task Force at the Hoover Institution. Right. Carolyn Hoxby is a brilliant economist who is devoted to choice and vouchers and charters. Uh, what she did, she's an economist, so what she did was to do what's called a projection. And, you know, she was also looking at these highly inflated state scores and said, ah, oh, you know, the, if you stayed in a charter for nine years, you would close the gap between Harlem and Scarsdale. But I think if she called a press conference, I don't know if there'd be any kids there to actually demonstrate the point because she was doing an econ econometric projection rather than a real analysis of kids who had been there for nine years. Okay, so one of the problems that you constantly point out is that the, the analysis, the testing, the reorganization is almost universally done by Economist. management experts and economists right. and not teachers. One of the criticisms of the... Bloomberg Klein administration is that they're all lawyers and McKinsey types. Right. Well, the, the approach that, that um, Mayor Bloomberg and Chancellor Klein have taken is very similar to No Child Left Behind, and that is the belief that incentives and sanctions are what move people. And so we're not, they, they just abolished a few weeks ago, they abolished their teaching and learning division because their theory, which is a, uh, it's based on the work of a, uh, a management expert named Bill Ochi. Ochi says if you give the principal control, the principal will work out those issues, leave that teaching and learning issues to them. And meanwhile, centrally, you just hold everyone accountable. So everything is accountability, incentives, and sanctions. And, you know, it's let, all management. Let, None of it's curriculum. Let me give and you teaching. a couple, of, couple of examples of one of the th shocking things. Stuyvesant High School takes in, I don't know, somewhere under 1,000 kids every year. Five years ago, out of the 900 or so kids that they admit to the freshman class, 83 were black children. In September 2009, it wasn't 83, it was seven. What, what's happened? I mean, this, is, this decline of the highest performing minority kids is happening across the city in all of the selective schools. Why? I think that with all the emphasis on basic skills testing, what they have neglected are history, civics, geography, literature, um, science, uh, the arts. I mean, there was a, a, a survey of the schools for arts programs. The city itself carried out the survey. A third of the schools don't even have arts teachers. So what we're seeing is, and you point this out in the book and, and, and your other articles, is that you've got this constant narrowing of what we're, what we're teaching. Basically, right. we're teaching math, reading, and then we're preparing students to take the test. We're doing it for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, preparing for a test. There's no trade-off in learning here? Aren't they yeah. testing better and learning less? Well, they're, te they're testing better, except that the tests themselves are so phony that we don't know how they're okay. testing. The, the other side of this, and I mentioned in that, in that article in the New York Times, was that when, when our high school graduates go to CUNY community colleges, 75% yep. of them need we remediation in reading, writing, and math. Now, if they have spent now 12 years focusing on reading, writing, and math, but they can't pass the entrance test and have to be remediated. I was recently at one of the community colleges uh, speaking, and the director of remediation pulled me aside and said, uh, we have a crisis here. The kids coming in from the high schools think that they're well prepared, uh, and when I tell them that they fail the remediation test and that they have to go into remedial reading, writing, or math, or all three, they say, but this is not possible. I, I graduated high school with an average in the 80s. 
and she said, it's getting worse every year. How do we then assess? How do we move from this very narrow range of, of, of testing to a more robust assessment? You know, it's not more assessment that we need. We need a different vision of good education. Okay. Okay, because if, if you had uh, the ability to send your children to the best schools in the world, or the best schools in America, they would go to a school that had reasonable class size, probably, you know, 15, 20 kids in a classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about the best. Okay. Uh, all right, it would have a very fabulous program in the arts. It would have a program in literature where you were reading the classics from many different cultures. Uh, you would have history and geography every year uh, and, and cumulatively design. Uh, you would have a wonderful science program with many sciences, not just a biology class or a basic living. Uh, and, and there would be foreign languages. You might even have more than one foreign language to choose from. This is what you would consider a good education if you could have anything you wanted. Uh, but we have a school system now that spends something over $20 billion for a million children. We should have enough money to make sure that all children have a good education. But we're so focused on incentives and sanctions. I mean, the last round of state testing caused the city to give out over $30 million in bonuses based on phony test scores. I mean, we, there ought to be a way to say, and, and I hope that Arne Duncan in the next iteration of, of the federal law will say, if you want to get federal funding, you better make sure that you have an arts program in every school. You better make sure that you have a full curriculum in every school and somehow reverse this, this outrageous trend towards dumbing down the curriculum and narrowing it. Well, and in fact, you argue persuasively that curriculum should be at the center of our concern, not reorganizations. One of your uh, most telling critiques of the New York City system is its constant reorganizations. We've had, I mean, you wrote the great school wars about these pendulum of centralization and decentralization, but usually they took decades or generations. We've had six major changes in, what, seven years? Right. What, what, why all the reorganization and what have been the results of the reorganization? Well, the, the um, you know, as you point out in the Great School Wars, it used to be every 25 to 40 or even 50 years, there'd be a major reorganization. We'd go from centralization to decentralization, discover that that didn't work, and then go back to a more centralized form. In this case, we went from the decentralization of 1969 to a very tightly centralized, um, more so than ever in the history of the school system, uh, where the mayor controlled everything. You know, in, in, the, in the past, you could say, well, the mayor appointed all the members of the school board, but then they were independent. They didn't require his approval to, to uh, make independent judgments. So now, uh, within this centralized system, we've had a lot of management change because, you know, another management theory comes along, and because the mayor has doesn't have to check with anybody else, he doesn't need anyone's permission. Mm -hmm. Normally, if you have a school board, they'd say, let's have hearings, let's hear from people who don't agree. That would be slowing down the process of change, but with nothing to slow down the process, you can have change. The mayor can turn around and say, you know, let's close Times Square pedestrian. Let's have a pedestrian wall right. in the middle of Times Square. It's right. done. Right. He can do the same thing with the school system. What's the vision? Is there a vision in, in, the, in New York City? Yeah. I'd say the vision right now is, is one uh, that involves a lot of privatization uh, and a continuation of the incentives and sanctions. Uh, I don't think there's a larger vision than that. I don't think there is what I would consider a vision of what, what good education is or what you would want for your own children. Uh, I think that as because of the expansion of the number of charters, uh, the mayor has said he wants 100,000 children in privately managed charter schools. My guess would be if, if the charters follow the pattern that's been true of every reform, it's that in the beginning you get the best people, but as time goes on with any reform, as it expands, it gets diluted, and our charters, New York City charters, will start looking like charters nationally. Charters nationally do not produce better results uh, than the regular public schools. Many of them are absolutely dreadful, uh, and it's tough to close them down because they'll march the kids, they'll march the parents, and, they'll, and, and we'll also find with 100,000 people in charter schools, a, almost like political shock troops that will go out on behalf of the founders and owners of the charters to say we need more charters. We want two hundred thousand charters. We want three hundred thousand in charters. And this is being and this is being fostered by the Obama administration and their race to the top with right. their requirement uh, that uh, you move to a charter if you want federal funds. Right. Now, what's the data in New York City? Are charters successful? If so, when? If not, why not and when? Well, I, you know, the data that I've seen suggests that we that New York City has better charters than most places. 
but most places don't have very good charters. We have, uh, and we have charter scandals in this city as well. We've had a number of, of charters that, where there have been financial scandals and corruption, and uh, you know, there has to be. One of the things, I was at a hearing in April that Senator Bill Perkins of uh, Harlem ran, and I made two points. Not a very popular guy with the uh, pro-charter folks. No, they, well, they, they hate him. I mean, they just used all of their resources to batter him and batter him. But, but I made two points. One is the charters nationally. We know that charters don't produce better results. There are 5,000 of them in aggregate. They're no better than regular public schools. So if we create, if we turn them into 10,000 or 20,000, it's not, it's going to be a huge investment, a lot of private money uh, being made, and no benefit overall to American education. The other point is that in New York State, there was no oversight of the charters. They had no, they were doing their own test scoring, so who knows how well they do. Uh, the other th point was that they resisted auditing. They actually went to court to prevent being audited by the state controller. And my point was, you take public money, you get public audits. Mm -hmm. and, and uh, one of the charter supporters on, on Senator Perkins' panel just lashed out at me, and the next day the Daily News called me a lunatic because I said there should be auditing. Well, of course there has to be auditing. You can't have public money and well, say they, it's mine. Call, I, didn't, I didn't see you the Daily News calling you a lunatic. I uh -huh. read Poobah, but right. lunatic's even better. Yeah, I mean, how does good? it feel to be characterized as a crazy lady? <laughs> I guess I should take it as a badge of honor, considering. I, 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 think, I think you ought to. Another one of your critiques revolves around the small schools. And going to, to the book, you talk about, you know, these billionaire philanthropists like like Gates, like uh, Broad, uh, like uh, uh, the Walmart folks, Michael Dell. What, what, what's the school size? What, what is the argument that for small schools? And are they successful? Well, Bill Gates decided they weren't successful because he pumped $2 billion into creating small high schools. Right. Now, was there any empirical evidence of this? No, his empirical evidence was that they didn't produce better results than the large high schools, which is why after investing $2 billion, he then pulled the plug and stopped doing it. Now he's putting his money into charter schools uh, and into this idea that the, the big problem... So is this like a hobby of the philanthropist? Yeah, sure. Is, you know? I mean, when you have billions of dollars, you have to figure some place to put it, right? Uh, but... Uh, the uh, the data on small schools are that, you know, sometimes it's nice the kids have warm relationships with their teachers. What do they lose? They lose advanced courses in math, advanced courses in science. They, they often lose the opportunity to take uh, more than one foreign language. Uh, special ed kids are, are left out. English language learners are left out. So these are the trade-offs. In a large school, uh, you usually have advanced courses and special provisions for immigrant kids, special programs for kids who, who uh, have... Uh, interest that could not be served in a small school. Mm -hmm. the, I don't think the, the ideal size, according to the best research that I've seen, which is by Valerie Lee at the University of Michigan, the ideal size high school is about 1,200. Wow, um, and, and a lot of New York City high schools, certainly in the era that I grew up in, were multiples of that three right. and four times and now we larger have, than that. Now we have many high schools that are 300, 400, and they can't provide the advanced So class. there's a minimum. I mean, there, there are economies, if you will, of scale. Right. But on the other hand, there are some really, I mean, Francis Lewis High School, for instance, excellent school, right. and it's, yep. way, it's way overcrowded now. It's far beyond its capacity. So what's happening is you're shifting, you're shifting students out of certain schools and moving them even more into the larger school. It's sort of perverse, no? Well, it, I describe it in the book, the book as being like a computer virus, that if you take a large school with, that has, say, 3,000 kids, and you replace it with uh, five schools that have 400 each, a thousand kids are not going to be accepted in those small schools. Right. They will be the low performing kids, the kids who don't speak English, the kids with extreme disabilities. They get put into another large school, which then gets destabilized by having extraordinary numbers of kids with high needs. And so this, it goes from school to school, knocking out one large high school after another. Are there models out there? Models of what? Successful? Good, yes, successful well, systems? We, we, of successful, right now, every system is suffering from no child left behind. I mean, okay. this is the terrible thing with, you know, making a federal mandate that's a bad mandate is that the whole system is suffering with this. But there, there are some very good school systems. Austin, Texas has a good school system. Charlotte, North Carolina has a good school system. And there are best system. practices that could be generalized yeah. probably from these experiences. Right, right. And, and you know, the curriculum that, that I've admired tremendously is the core knowledge curriculum. I think there are a very small number of schools in New York City have it that have it, but the idea is you want all children to have an excellent curriculum, that, that, and if you don't have the arts, you don't have a, a good curriculum. Okay. In a minute, you're Arnie Duncan. What do you, you, what do you tell President Obama, and how do you behave as secretary, or 
you get named the new chancellor of the New York City Public Schools. That'll never well, happen. Well, that'll obviously. never happen. I mean, I'm but, not, not going to be let's, either. Let, let's be hallucin I mean, let's hallucinate right. a bit. Okay. You're the New York City Schools Chancellor. What do you do? Well, let, let's step back and say the reason that I've been able to be listened to is that I don't have any ambitions. I mean, at my okay. age, I don't want to be chancellor. I don't want to be secretary of right. education. I this can, is I a can hypothetical. Say what I think. I'm, I'm, I, I'm going to sit at Arnie Duncan's shoulder, and the first thing I'll say to Arnie is, Arnie, do whatever I tell you. The first thing you do... <laughs> Go ahead. First thing you do is go to the president and say, we need to fully fund special education. We've put out a mandate there where we put up about 12% of the money. Every district in this country is suffering with a tremendous budget crisis. We can't continue to underwrite their budget, but we can fully fund what we mandate. That would immediately create fiscal relief for every city and district in this country. Secondly, let's put into our Elementary and Secondary Education Act when we do the reauthorization we're going to remove all punishments, all sanctions. It's not the job of the federal government to tell everybody what to do because we don't know what to do. I tried it in Chicago and it didn't work. Chicago is one of the among the lowest performing districts in the country. The scores have been flat there. Uh, so I can't tell everyone what to do. Opening schools, closing schools, opening, closing, opening, closing. Didn't work. Charter schools, on average, they're no better than regular public schools. So let us remove all the punishments and sanctions. Let's uh, make our national assessment test, which we give everywhere, available to any district that wants to use it on a sampling basis, mm -hmm. no punishments attached. And then let's have the, here's what the federal government does best. We protect the rights, of, civil rights of, of vulnerable children. We make sure that there's adequate funding for districts that, that need adequate funding, which we'll do by funding special ed. Uh, we provide good research uh, about what's working and not, mm -hmm. what's not working. But we don't, we, we at least do no harm. And what we're doing now is harm. So that would be a very good start. Thank you. And this has been an excellent set of conversations. My special thanks to Diane Ravitch, author of The Death and Life of the Great American School System. See you next week. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.